OK. Well, um, thank you all for being here. Um, good morning, good uh, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, we, we really appreciate you all joining us and uh, we're really very excited about um, what, what we have today in, in this session. And let me share my screen real quick. Um, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, okay. So again, we're we're very excited about um, uh, this this uh, the, the four presentations that we have. We're, we're we're thankful that you all were able to join us, and we're honored to have uh, these uh, presentations and these speakers. Um, many of probably uh, that you all know or uh, have read their work or have heard speak, and so we're very honored to have to have each of them. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We will have the the Q and A uh, option open for you all to put your your questions in um, for the end of the 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 all the talks. At the very end, we will be able to handle some of those questions and have a, a separate Q A Q and A session. So, put your your questions in the Q and A uh, uh, section, and then if there's any issues, we have some people here that can can help with. Uh, troubleshooting on on that front, um, and um, just as a reminder, um, our our agenda, which which many of you saw, uh, we will be going through four presentations uh, here today, and uh, we're we're excited to just uh, to jump right in and and get into it. So um, I will stop sharing my screen here so we can go to. Uh, Dr. Halur. OK, OK, um, so yes, our, our, so first up we'll have uh, Dr. Vinay Vine Kumar Halur. Sorry about that. Um, that will be speaking on the diagnostic workup for fungal infections uh, and how to optimize laboratory testing. Uh, Dr. Halur uh, is the additional professor in charge of and also in, in charge of the Advanced Molecular and Diagnostic Research Center for, for Fungi in East India. Uh, at the Department of Microbiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And so we're honored to have you here today. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Hulur. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, do let me know if there is any issues. Uh, is, it, is it working now? Yes. Uh, is my Very screen good. visible? OK, yes. uh, good evening all and uh, at the outset, uh, I would thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, I have no financial disclosures and, uh, you know, uh, we had a 16 year old female uh, come to us with a three year, a three month history of uh, swelling of the face and uh, she had visited several doctors, received multiple antibiotics without any relief. Uh, so on examination, she had a firm non-tender cold subcutaneous swelling in the nose, which was confirmed on radiology. Uh, absolutely no finding when we investigated her for routine, uh, routine hematological malignancies, hematological investigations. So uh, up front, this, this girl was troubled by this uh, lesion. She was a girl and it was disfiguring her face and she had re received multiple antibiotics. So on presentation, we were, we were confused whether it was uh, whether it was a fungal infection or a pyogenic infection or uh, or a malignancy. And we did a fungal culture and what we got was conidio bullus. Uh, and subsequently, we started on a, her on saturated solution of potassium iodide and itraconazole. And this was how she looked after uh, around three to six months of therapy. This we published and uh, this is a pretty uncommon infection that happens in, in India and other tropical countries, but there are some common invasive fungal infections like invasive candida, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, cryptococcosis and systemic fungal infections. Now, many of these uh, infections 
have non specific clinical signs and symptoms that is they don't respond to fever they uh, in in a patient with cancer or pre existing illness who has cough or uh, hemop uh, hemoptysis or altered sensorium or headache which could mean uh, any disease and even on imaging they mimic other diseases so uh, they mimic bacterial infections tb malignancy allergy embolism and many other things but they have a very high mortality or case fatality range, rates that ranges from 40 to 90%. Treatment is available and treatment is effective, but any delay in treatment increases the mortality and the treatment that is available is toxic and for countries like India, it's extremely expensive. So whenever we need to diagnose a fungal infection, we have to do it fast and we have to do it right. Otherwise, the patient has to bear the consequences of the delay as well as wrong infection, wrong uh, diagnosis. So, so uh, whenever a patient comes to us, uh, what and we are suspecting a fungal infection, what we do is we collect uh, the sample, and the sample is routinely subjected. Depending on the type of the sample, it is subjected to microscopic examination by way of a rapid KOH, calcofluoride staining or histology and culture or molecular test. Once the, uh, once the culture is obtained, there is a growth of yeast. The yeast is identified conventionally using biochemicals, but these days we have some automated systems that help us identify them. For mold, usually it is morphology. But these days we have Malditoff, which has made the life of people easy and it helps identify both yeast and mold. Now, uh, tests in patients suspected of candidemia, fungemia or other invasive fungal infections, there are tests that are available and these tests include blood culture, serological tests and PCR. Uh, and in blood culture, once the organism is obtained, again, it is subjected to the above methods for identification. So what is the what is the problem with conventional methods? Conventional methods like microscopy and culture are considered to be as gold standards for diagnosis of invasive fungal infection. Now, what we need to remember is that all these, both these tests require invasive sampling and an absolute essential for us to report these tests is that uh, they, it, it needs high level of expertise. While microscopy is rapid, it cannot identify species. And culture, though it identifies species and makes available material for antifungal susceptibility testing, it has low sensitivity and is time consuming. So these methods may not give us the results when we need it, as in as I told, if you delay the therapy, the patient might land in trouble. And if you give unnecessary therapy, it might cause patient uh, patients financial problems. And if the patient has a disease and you don't give him the therapy, he may die. So because of the low sensitivity and, and, and uh, delayed time, culture is no longer considered by many people as a gold standard, it's considered as a copper standard. So how do we, with, with this knowledge, how do we optimize the uh, optimize the available uh, methods for my culture or microscopy? So the point that you need to remember is that always we should obtain the best quality and the maximum quantity of sample from the anatomical site of the suspected infection. It is always better to obtain surgical biopsy wherever possible. In an event you cannot identify, uh, obtain a surgical biopsy, you could go for a pus or fine needle aspirated aspirate. This could be image guided or it could be blind. Or, and in patients with pulmonary infections, you could uh, obtain any of the invasive or non-invasive samples like bi biopsy, ball, brushings or sputum. In cases of fungemia or moldemia, you can obtain blood and blood uh, and, and what you need to remember is whenever you are suspecting an invasive fungal infection, uh, please do not obtain a swab uh, unless it's, it's not possible for you to get any other sample. Swabs are discouraged when it comes to diagnosis of fungal infections. 
Now, uh, every sample that you obtain for a fungal, a suspected fungal infection should undergo microscopy. Why? Because this help us reject samples that do not meet standards. And when subjected to histopathology, it tells us whether there is an inflammation or not, which helps us again find out if the, uh, the organism that has been isolated is a colonizer or a pathogen. And what you need to remember is all fluids need to be concentrated prior to mounts. And when you, when you are doing microscopy, a rapid microscopy, for most of the fungi, use optical brightness like calcofluor white or blancofluor. This will increase the sensitivity as well as make it more rapid. However, one point that you need to remember is melanized fungi may not flourish when you are using calcofluor white. And in such samples where you are suspecting and in every sample, you should, after doing a calcofluor white fluorescent microscopy, you should switch on your bright field and scan the slides for any, any melanized fungi. If it's pneumocystis, uh, pneumocystosis, use immunofluorescence test. If you are suspecting cryptococcosis, then use India ink. So in culture, uh, if it's a suspected fungemia case, always obtain 20 to 30 uh, ml of blood in a set. Use standard blood culture vials when you are suspecting candida or cryptococcus and special media for dimorphic fungal infections. Lysis centrifugation was again considered as a standard method long back, but recently the available special media and automated blood culture systems uh, reduced the increased rate of uh, contamination associated with lysis centrifugation and give good enough sensitivity and specificity. You can go uh, and as per IDSA, uh, every case of fungemia should be, uh, you should obtain blood cultures on a daily or alternate basis to uh, document uh, sterility of blood. So in other invasive samples, you can use inhibitory mold agar, which helps increase, which helps increase the isolation, primary isolation of yeast and molds. And an additional blood agar can help you identify a few other uh, dimorphic fungi uh, or so, so. And for dimorphic fungi, in a recent study, it was found that these uh, fungi were isolated after four weeks, which means that uh, you're, if you're suspecting an invasive uh, dimorphic fungal infection, you should, you should, uh, you should, uh, you should, you should incubate the cultures for more than four to six weeks. So identification, as I told, if it's a yeast, you use an automated system. And for both, you could use Malditoff. Now, the problem with these automated systems that are available is that the identification is limited by the database, the strength of the database. For example, in 2018, many of these equipments were not able to identify Candida auris. And uh, in such a scenario, you should you update your database once the company comes up with an update. And you should, uh, and in Malditoff, you have an option of using the REO database to identify those isolates which have not yet made it into the IVD database. So uh, Malditoff can also be used for earlier identification of fungi causing uh, fungemia. So uh, you could use the generic, uh, the, the in-house method, or you could use uh, the, the, the kits that are sold by the company and uh, identify the yeast uh, rapidly. So uh, identification in what, what to do for people who do not have such, such facilities like automated uh, systems for identification or Malditoff. Uh, you could presumptively identify the uh, drug resistant candida like uh, candida glabrata or candida cruzi or even recently candida auris by use of chromogenic agar. But what you need to remember is uh, that uh, uh, there is no test that is a perfect test for diagnosis of fungal infection. So uh, keeping in view the facts that uh, for invasive fungal infections, for invasive fungal infections, both the microscopy as well as culture, these have a very low yield. 
people started looking for alternatives and they came up with serological tests now serological tests they detect antigen or antibody and have been used in the diagnosis of aspergillosis cryptococcosis and systemic fungal infections now the problem with them is that they have a high rate of false positivity or false negativity which again emphasizes the fact that there is no perfect test for diagnosis of fungal infection i am not going into the details of serological testing as my colleague is going to talk about it later similarly uh, so what are the available tests uh, when it comes to serological testing we have beta d glucan we have galactomannan we have mannan and antimannan antibodies we have cryptococcal capsular polysaccharide antigen and we have histoplasma antigen while antibodies we have cacta antimannan aspergillus precipitans and histoplasma this is not an exhaustive list this is the list of those that are usually used in the laboratory i will not go into the details uh, as my colleague is going to talk about it later so even in molecular testing we have the conventional formats which can detect all fungi by by uh, directing the pan fungal pcr or we have species specific pcr Additionally, molecular testing can also help in resistance detection, and molecular testing could be a part of syndromic testing. While uh, these days uh, we are having next generation sequencing, uh, and this could help in identifying the the fungal infections earlier compared to the conventional methods. Again, the details will be dealt by the next speaker. So uh, you know. Uh, by the end of this you you have pretty much an idea that fungal infections are different they are the odd balls and why they are an odd ball is because there are not even enough experts as i told microscopy and culture needs expertise for interpretation there are, there is a huge group of fungi that cause infections so the test that you might be using might not detect that fungi and the fungal load in the blood and in other uh, fluids is much much less compared to viruses and bacteria and the available tests that are that we have are imperfect they are not perfect and those that are even available uh, are they cost effective uh, for diagnosis and another problem or challenge that people who want to develop uh, tests face is that the fungal taxonomy is changing there are no reference standards or reference standards if somebody wishes to uh, develop a fungal uh, test there are there's a problem of lack of reference standards and even after developing a, uh, in a diagnostic we do not have adequate patients or we cannot run trials unless it's a multicentric multinational trial we will not get good results for the newly developed test so then uh, keeping uh, all these issues in mind how can we optimize the Uh, testing for fungi so to optimize the testing for fungi we have to have standard specimen collection and testing protocols uh, some of which i discussed earlier we could use multiple diagnostic methods for increasing the sensitivity and specificity and as always interpret results in clinical context and once you interpret the clinical context uh, the 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 investigations in clinical context context Uh, inform it immediately to the clinician so uh, one very good example of uh, of of a way in which it was done was the guidelines for pneumocystosis uh, one of the speakers is a primary author of this guidelines and here they have used a standardized sample uh, a standardized sample and then either a, a group of tests for arriving at the diagnosis so uh, that would be all from me uh thank you very much for your patient uh, hearing uh jt that is all from me all right thank you thank you so much dr halur um we do have uh um a couple minutes here so i i, I just had a quick question about um um you mentioned just adherence to the guidance and the guidelines for um following these algorithms um and this might be a much bigger question but what what's the in your opinion what's what's the best way to disseminate those that knowledge of the the algorithms and the guidelines um not just in the reference centers but out to um all levels of the healthcare clinics uh 
thank you for the question uh, nice question uh, so the the best way of doing it would be you know try to catch the doctors in training uh, at first so the the doctors who are training they need to be made uh, aware that there are guidelines and there are algorithms standard algorithms for testing another way would be uh, conducting programs like this wherein uh, people join and they update their knowledge and uh, i guess that that would be it if any of the other speakers would want to add to it yeah um okay yeah thank you very much um so i think we can um we can move on to our our next presenter here thank you again dr halur um very very good presentation there um kind of setting setting the tone setting the stage for the rest of these um uh so next up uh will be dr argadip samadur um is from he's He's from um, the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences and the Institute of National Importance. He's the assistant professor uh, in, in the Department of Neuromicrobiology. Um, and he will be speaking on the non-culture-based diagnostic assays for invasive fungal infections. So uh, Dr. Samadar, uh, honored to have you. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, JT, for uh, the, the brief introduction. And also thanks to uh, Dr. Vinay for uh, giving us a uh, thorough overview of the different uh, diagnostic modalities that we have in place for the diagnosis of invasive fungal infections. Uh, I hope my screen is visible, right? Yes, it is. OK, so first of all, when we start thinking about the fungal infections, so uh, the most uh, common question sometimes which I come across from different colleagues and uh, even students, uh, why are you so much interested in fungal infections? Uh, it's so rare, means there are so many other infections which are important. So the thing that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, we all know that uh, we had a, a very big uh, burst of cases of COVID-19 associated mycormycosis. And uh, the reason also we don't we know that it was due to the use of so many means immunosuppressive medications, especially steroids. So WHO also is extremely concerned regarding the growing incidence of fungal infections throughout the world. So WHO lists the top fungal health threats and also the priority pathogens also has been given by the WHO. And as uh, many a times we get this, the rise of invasive fungal infections, particularly in the context of Candida auris throughout the world, also in the US, also in India. And then the Scientific American, they came up with this, the next deadly plague, and it is likely to be a fungal pathogen. And also we know about this uh, movie, The Last of Us, where actually the, what actually can be a fungal pandemic, uh, the, that horrifying scenes have come in front of us. So actually these are not exaggerations. Basically countries are the places which are not reporting fungal infections and not the ones who are actually looking for them. So in India also and also in most other countries, like most other countries in the world, uh, centers who are actually reporting fungal infections are the ones who are actually looking for them. So there is a wake, global wake up call and the latest fungal research reveals that the double is the death toll than the previous estimates. I'll be covering in brief regarding the uh, epidemiology and also the burden of fungal infections. This is the uh, very recently published paper in January 2024 about the global incidence and mortality of severe fungal disease. But actually the annual incidence is around six and a half million invasive fungal infections and 3.8 million deaths. So that's a huge figure. And the current estimates of the incidence and mortality are almost double the prior estimates. So invasive aspergillosis in new group of patients, particularly COPD, ICU patients and lung cancer are much, much more as compared to the invasive aspergill invasive candidiasis with negative blood cultures and mucormycosis. So this is the data that uh, has been produced in this uh, article. So we can see that it is at roughly around 7 million cases with, uh, which, which have an annual incidence of invasive fungal infections all over the world and almost like 3.8 million is the crude mortality. So that's a huge number. And as you can see in the graphs that majority of the cases are actually invasive aspergillosis. Then we have the chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. We have candidemia and also invasive candidiasis. Then it is followed by the pneumocystis pneumonia, then cryptococcal meningitis, and of course, mycormycosis. 
So this actually is the annual number of people who are affected and the number of estimated deaths. So as you can see that invasive aspergillosis accounts for majority of the cases of this annual incidence as well as the estimated deaths and the majority of the population they are either smoking related to some sort of underlying lung disorders like COPD, intensive care, admission, lung cancer or leukemia. And in the invasive candida infection, the majority have uh, of the patients either they are the premature neonates or those who are under cancer chemotherapy are having underlying diabetes or some sort of major surgery, major trauma or burns, renal failure and excessive and overuse of unnecessary antibiotics. That is a huge concern in particularly the developing world who don't have much uh, restriction on the use of antibiotics and over the counter antibiotics. And we have the chronic aspergillosis disease of the lungs. This is actually quite underrated and underestimated because we see this disease right now in majority of the patients who have recovered from TB after having completed the antitubercular therapy and also uh, patients who have an underlying asthma or a lung surgery. And then we have other severe fungal diseases, particularly cryptococcal meningitis, the endemic mycosis, histoplasmosis, then coxidiomycosis and paracoxidiomycosis. This mainly affect the patients with underlying immunodeficiency, having diabetes or severe asthma and uh, also cancer chemotherapy. So the largest contribution to deaths is undiagnosed and untreated cases. So what action should be taken to reduce the mortality? First of all, we have to diagnose this uh, fungal infections optimally. So unless you optimize the diagnostic assays, we are not able to find out cases. And many of these cases are likely to be uh, misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. And consequently, they will be treated for some other disease and not the fungal disease. So the prompt and accurate identification of the causative fungi is the cornerstone and improved diagnostic capacity clinician awareness, particularly in the developing countries, and also a timely diagnosis. And if we want to achieve a timely diagnosis, as Dr. Uh, Erlur has already mentioned in the previous presentation, that we can't simply rely on the culture-based assays because they are time-consuming, lack sensitivity, and many a times they are negative. So the management considerations encompass this uh, access to affordable antifungal agents, surgical resection, wherever it is possible, timely removal of the indwelling medical devices, particularly in candidemia, and reversal of immunosuppression, correction of the underlying immunodeficiency, and avoidance of any sort of drug toxicity and interactions. So what are the challenges that we face in the conventional diagnostics? First, I mentioned that this low sensitivity, and I belong to a center where actually we get a lot of CNS fungal infection cases, and the main sample for us is CSF. So as we know that CSF is a precious sample, we cannot have the sample as uh, always, and uh, maybe it is just a one-time tapping in this patient. So in such a case, either the quantity is not sufficient or and also the sun sensitivity of culture is very less, around 15%. So most of the times we are not able to recover these uh, pathogens from the CSF using conventional modalities. And slow turnaround time, whenever you are using some conventional methods, definitely the turnaround time is actually huge. So sometimes it takes days and we have to follow up these cultures for around four weeks before considering them as negative. And laborious process, generally they are personal dependent and also require expertise to identify the fungus and also to perform antimicrobial susceptibility and <clears throat> also to say definitively that this is a fungal infection. And majority of the specimens required for conventional procedures are uh, invasive uh, samples. So particularly CSF or a tissue biopsy, which may not be feasible in all the settings, particularly in ICU patients, you cannot obtain a biopsy always. And aspirates. So blood culture sensitivity, as we know, the culture negative cases of candidemia are quite uh, large and it is around 50 to 95%. And molds have even a lower sensitivity. And as we know that these days with the advent of new diagnostic tools and with the advent of this molecular diagnostics, uh, certain cryptic species of fungi are being detected and identified. And these may or may not be always isolated in cultures and we cannot even grow them in cultures many times. And as I know that uh, in many of the labs, those uh, who are not able to identify the fungus, they have a concept of discarding those cultures as purported contaminants. 
So this is another challenge that in many of the fungi, they do not sporulate. They do not produce the characteristic structures. And most of the times, they're not able to identify it with the con conventional techniques. So, so in those cases, it, there is a tendency to discard them as contaminants, which is another uh, great concern. So the advantages of non-culture-based assays include the rapid results, a short turnaround time, non-invasive nature of samples, particularly blood, urine, sputum, we can use them for the diagnostics, may serve as potential prognostic marker, and we can also give a positive result when the culture is negative. Uh, it may be helpful in cases of non-culturable fungal pathogens, which we won't be able to recover in culture. And it is useful to when it is difficult to obtain some specimens like biopsies, uh, particularly in the context of ICU admission, when we cannot obtain a biopsy always. So these are the different modalities that we have. Uh, already, uh, Dr. Halur has given an overview. So we have a serology-based diagnostics consisting of antigen and antibody detection. We have molecular diagnostics. Then we have the upcoming biosensor-based assays, which are still a bit in the research phase. And we have combined approaches that many of the recent publications, they are focusing on machine learning and on artificial intelligence. So this is the uh, description of a fungal cell wall where you can see that outside layer consists of the manoproteins where we have the manin, galactomannan, and this uh, glucoroxylomalin and the galactoxinomalin. So we have the beta D glucan, which is sandwiched between the chitin and the manoproteins. And this is one of the potential uh, targets for our biomarker analysis. And then we have certain other markers which I'll be con coming in the next slides. And certainly then we have the genomic DNA which we can use for our uh, PCR based assays. So these are the different platforms which are available for the detection of these biomarkers. Uh, we have the very popular the latex agglutination test and we are routinely using it for the detection of cryptococcal meningitis. We have the enzyme immunoassay in which we have the direct, indirect, and sandwich format. And many of these are used particularly for histoplasmosis, plastomycosis, and also we have cryptococcus enzyme immunoassay and the galactomannan antigen, which is also a, a enzyme immunoassay format. And we can also detect the antibodies, particularly the in the context of this allergy bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, where we have to detect the aspergillus specific IgE. And we have chronic pulmonary aspergillosis with aspergillus IgG. And it is also useful in coxidiasis and this blastomyces species. We have an immunodiffusion, which uh, previously used to be one of the very helpful assays for histoplasma and blastomyces. But right now, we have very uh, good antigen detection assays, histoplasma galactoman and antigen, which uh, we have from EMI as well as the Miravista diagnostics in the urine samples. And we have a complement fixation test, particularly for the histoplasma, blastomyces, and coccidiasis. Lateral flow assay are really a point of care test for the diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis and also for this aspergillus galactoman and detection. We can also have this uh, lateral flow format from uh, some of the companies which have come up with the aspergillus IgG IgM format. Then we have Western blot also, which is not being used quite uh, often in most of the laboratories, but we can use it for detection of aspergillus IgG particularly when the FADIA system is not available uh, because that's a very expensive instrument equipment. And unless we uh, have a lot of samples, it is not very economical to uh, use that uh, platform. And we have the immunofluorescence antibody test, particularly uh, for this pneumocystis. And we have the beta D glucan assay, which is a quite popular assay biomarker for uh, the diagnosis of several invasive fungal infections. So if we see this diagram, we can be able to understand that th there are several species of fungi and we have the different targets. So we have the mannan antigen antibody, which is detected in candida. We have galactomannan, which is mainly in aspergillus, sometimes in fusarian and of course in certain other fungi like penicillium and uh, also in uh, this uh, histoplasma. So we don't have this galactomannan in this mucoralis, cryptococcus and pneumocystis. We have the cryptococcal antigen for diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis. As you can see, beta D glucan is a pan fungal marker and it can be there in several species of fungi, particularly Candida aspergillus and PCR, which is one of the very important uh, new diagnostic modalities, which has a very high sensitivity and uh, specificity as well. 
but we have to remember that uh, galactamine positivity can be due to penicillium also so and but this is important in bowel because uh, unless uh, that fluid is processed in a sterile way and uh, there is no other colonization then it, it is fine but otherwise penicillium species is also can give some uh, false positivity with galactamine so we have beta 1 3 glucan assay which is a very popular uh, uh, test for uh, diagnosis of invasive fungal infections of course it has a very high negative predictive value which helps in ruling out the uh, fungal infections but if it is positive we have to really uh, consider everything carefully uh, before giving it as a diagnosis of invasive fungal infection so we have it is uh, the beta d glucan which is an important component of the fungal cell wall and it's a pan fungal assay as i have mentioned and it can be detected in several species of fungi as uh, it is showing and it is not useful in case of cryptococcus mucoralis and blastomyces so there are several commercial kits with different cutoff values and its presence in blood core it's actually correlates with good npv that is negative predictive value so there are several commercial beta glucan assays as i can see that uh, yes that we have the fungital which was actually a, the only fda approved uh, kit or the test that has been uh, in use and it has been there since last 20 years of course in the uh, next few decades we have dynamicer and also waco and right now we have the fungital stat so fungital stat and the convent traditional fungital basically uh, are the same tests they are based on colorimetry but uh, when we have a, a low batch testing or means less number of samples it is economical or useful to have a fungital stat rather than the traditional kinetical as a reader which will require at least 21 samples to complete one run so Fungital stat is a low batch platform where actually we can have the same type of assay with the same platform for diagnosis of IFIs. So this is important. And uh, Waco in 2018, they have, it is the Fiji film company which has introduced this uh, test. So there are several means uh, concordances and discordances in different settings and different patient populations. So this is not uh, one means uh, uh, gold standard assay rather it can assist in the diagnosis but if it is negative it has a very high predi uh, negative predictive value so it helps in ruling out fungal infections so this is a brief about this waco test procedure and features as you can see uh, in this uh, i mean figure so the measurement range is around six to six hundred picogram per ml and we have a cutoff of seven picogram per ml while in this uh, uh, fungital assay, it is 80 picogram. So the cutoffs actually have been uh, described in uh, different formats differently. So it is not the same format and cutoffs need to be uh, standardized before we can consider it as a final. So stat standardization of the assay along with establishment of an optimal cutoff is very much important while interpretation of these tests. And the measurement time is approximately 90 minutes. As uh, this figure has already been shown by uh, Dr. Binet, and this is from one of our speakers who will be uh, means uh, who is there for, with us today. So here it is actually very much useful, particularly for the diagnosis of pneumocystis uh, gyrovesi pneumonia. And here we can see that BD, serum BDG is one of the markers that we can use whether it uh, for ruling in or ruling out the uh, I mean condition. And after that, we have a quantitative real-time PCR assay, which can actually help in diagnosing these cases. So what are the main advantages of Fungital and WACO for the diagnosis of IFIs? So this figure says, uh, means everything. So the Fungital assay actually has a better sensitivity and specific, better sensitivity as compared to WACO. So this is very important. And as we can see that majority of the work and studies they have been done with by using fungital and the cutoff has been established at 80 picogram but with waco there is one uh, problem because this is not the uh, this is not based on calorimetry it is based on turbidimetry and they have seen that uh, if we reduce the cutoff from the uh, uh, kit cutoff of 11 to 7 to 3 then the sensitivity increases so uh, as you can see in this figure that with the 11 cutoff then we have a sensitivity of around 60%. If we reduce it to 5 picogram per ml, it approaches almost 80%.
and if it is around three or four picogram per ml it is around 82 percent so this uh, things uh, means these values are quite uh, different uh, according to the cutoff levels so we have to standardize the cutoff and we have to check the percentage of agreement so this is fungital versus vaco for diagnosis of uh, ifis where actually one study it has shown that how exactly the number of positives differed according to the cutoffs now coming to the galactomannan assay so galactomannan is one of the side chains with a uh, galactofuranosyl and it is actually one important component of the fungal cell wall so there we are using a rat monoclonal antibody that is EBA2 plus a peroxidase, and this happens to be a chromogenic reaction with the through a TMB substrate, and that gives rise to the OD value. So we have a specific galactomannan OD level, though it has been standardized mainly for serum. For BAL, the optimal cutoff is still not clear. So I'll be coming to the uh, recent, uh, I mean, advances in the galactomannan. So kinetics of a uh, galactomannan release is very important to understand its uh, function. So basically in neutropenic patients who have a high fungal burden and along with angio invasion, there actually the serum and bile galactomannan are very high and it can be easily detectable. While in non-neutropenic patients, the serum galactomannan actually doesn't perform well because of the scarce fungal load and uh, since there is minimal NGO invasion, so you don't expect uh, the galactomannan to be there in the circulation. And particularly in cases of abscess, we don't actually get it in the serum at all. So mainly it is in the infection site, it is confined, so it doesn't come to the circulation. So it depends on the fungal burden and also on the degree of NGO invasion, particularly in neutropenic patients, this is very much useful. And as we have seen that uh, it is uh, not just the invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, you also have the influenza associated pulmonary aspergillosis and COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis, where actually these assays have been, mm, I mean, uh, validated. So basically, depending on the degree of NGO invasion, we can see in neutropenic, the, it has a, a sensitivity of around 70%, while in case of non-neutropenic patients, particularly in the settings of this uh, uh, IAPA and Kappa, the serum galactomannan uh, sensitivity is not that great. And the untreated patients, the baseline mortality is around 67%. While in case of non-neutropenic patients, the untreated, it is around 90%. So basically it can be used in neutropenic patients with a, a high confidence, but in case of non-neutropenic patients, the diagnostic significance uh, is doubtful. So serum galactomannan's performance characteristics, this is also one uh, from one article from one of our speakers who is who will, who will be speaking in the uh, next round. So we can see that it differs according to the population. So what type of patients you are using this galactomannan for the diagnosis of IFI is very, very important. So if it is a hematologic malignancy, we can see that the sensitivity is very less. Well, specificity remains around 95%. Well, in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, it is around 65 and in solid organ, it is 41. So it has been seen that uh, the chances of false negative, uh, false positive galactomannan are high, in, particularly in lung transplant recipients. And also if there is some colonization uh, with aspergillus. So right now, the ITSA guideline I have written on the right side, use of serial serum galactomannan is advocated only in patients with hematological malignancies and hematopoietic stem cell transplants, not in solid organ transplants, who have an elevated galactomannan at the baseline. And this is primarily used for disease progress, monitoring disease progression, therapeutic response and prediction of outcomes. So a higher cutoff threshold, it has a better diagnostic utility. So instead of 0.5, it has been taken as one. Galactomannan ODI, that is optical density index, more than two at baseline is associated with a poor outcome. Declining galactomannan is a predictor of survival. And if a patient is a mold active and uh, antifungal therapy, it there is a significant impact on the sensitivity. So the sensitivity is uh, poor. I mean, it doesn't perform well, particularly if the patient is a mold active and uh, antifungals and decreased prognostic value in non-neutropenic patients. And the util utility improves if it is combined with PCR. So right now, galactomannan along with the quantitative real-time PCR is considered uh, as one of the standards for the diagnosis of uh, IFIs. 
So this we can see. This is one very interesting article which came up uh, very recently. That is means the volume of instillate that is used for collection of this bronchial lavage is also very important. We are actually collecting ball, but actually we don't know means how much fluid we have to collect. What should be the volume of the instillate? Because these are significant caveats. As you can see that there is a sampling error, non-standardized ball fluid collection and the site of infection. So these are the significant caveats and that plagues the use of these sort of assays. So in this paper, they mentioned that instillate volume has a significant effect on ball galactamine levels and the diagnostic accuracy as well as the cutoffs. So in practice, we have to use a minimum volume of 40 ml and uh, that should be the optimal volume you have to collect. And that has been standardized uh, and that should give the ideal results. But if we are not using any, uh, I mean, if we are deviating from that practice, then there should be a non-standardized ball fluid collection and then it becomes a problem to interpret the results. So this is the gist that we have to have a pretest probability. So if the pretest probability is high, then definitely both these biomarkers, that is beta deglucan and galactamanan, are going to perform well. So if the invasive aspergillosis prevalence is high, particularly in hematologic malignancies, neutropenia, and hemat hematopoietic stem cell transplants, then there is a high probability. And if the clinical suspicion is there, along with the radiological findings like lung nodules with a halo or an air present sign, then the pre trace probability is high in that settings that beta diglucan galactamine positivity is going to have a high post-test probability as well. And it is likely to be a case of invasive aspergillosis. So, and if it is negative, then there's a suspicion that remains. The sensitivity of the test is not very optimal. And thus it uh, decreases if there are any autoimmune diseases or solid cancers as I have already mentioned. There, if the pretest probability is low, then these uh, biomarkers do not really perform well. So you need to have a very high pretest probability along with the underlying conditions. There is a, should be high degree of clinical suspicion along with the supportive radiological findings. And in that context, the performance of both these biomarkers is fairly good. So this is uh, an interesting uh, finding that confounding factors for antigen antibody detection for the diagnosis of IFIs. So you can see that there are several confounding factors. For example, if there is an invasive growth of the hyphae and there is an intestinal translocation of those fungi, fungi into the bloodstream, followed by dissemination and release of antigen and antibodies. So the underlying diseases, concomitant treatment, what type of patient the treat, uh, treatment the patient is receiving, the nutritional modulation like total parenteral nutritional components, if there is a hypoxia or a reactive oxygen species biofilm formation, then antifungal drugs, several pretreatment cutoffs, uh, means whether it is defined or not, all these factors are actually the confounding factors that can uh, have an impact on antigen antibody detection. So I'm not going into the details of what I've already mentioned. So this actually explains that there can be situations where the beta diglucan is false positive and also the galactamanin is false positive. Of note, the uh, many, many, many times we get to hear that uh, it's the antibiotics like piperacillin tazobactam or amoxiclav, which causes the false positive galactamine in some patients. But the current formulations of these medicines uh, are actually uh, free from all these, uh, I mean, drawbacks. So the recent formulations do not have this sort of cross reactivity or a false positivity. So mostly it is due to these intravenous immunoglobulins or the use of a plasma light for taking ball or a leaky gut as we get in case of grass versus host disease and uh, in case of ice pops. So these are the major, uh, I mean, issues with the galactamanin that can give a false positive reaction. So then coming to the lateral flow devices, which are actually the point of care tests. So as you can see that uh, it has several advantages like time to result and also means the sensitivity and specificity in specific populations like proven and probable aspergillosis as well as in cases of cross reactivity. So uh, basically it means we can we have two platforms in place. One is the EME uh, aspergillus galactaman and lateral flow and the OLM. So I have given a comparison like what actually performs uh, best in different scenarios. So 
sample pretreatment is necessary in case of EME. And as you can see that the uh, sensitivity specificity in true wave and probable asper invasive aspergillosis is much, much higher in case of EME kids. And uh, also in the specificity is quite good. So there is a mixed population serum sensitivity specificity means in patients who are not belonging to this uh, probable and proven categories of invasive aspergillosis, there also the specificity and sensitivity specificity are fairly high enough. Cross reactivity, as we know with uh, galactomannan, it happens with certain other mold infections as well, like Cirrosporium, Fusarium, Candida parasolosis, and with uh, Aspenicillium species in case of OLM. So this is the procedure. More than the procedure is important about the time taken by the assays. So it is roughly around three hours if we are performing an enzyme assay format. And if it is a lateral flow assay, then it hardly takes 15 minutes to 30 minutes and some in some tests, the 45 minutes. So in within an hour, we are able to get the results. And in most cases, if we are using the EME or OLM, it is within 30 minutes. So this is the overall performance of this lateral flow in ball for diagnosis of proven and probable aspergillosis. So basically we have different patient groups like uh, solid organ transplant in ICU patients, respiratory diseases and hematological malignancies and the performance of this aspergillus lateral flow. As you can see, it performs fairly well in solid organ transplant recipients uh, with a high sensitivity and specificity and a high positive predictive value and a negative predictive value. So next is cryptococcal antigen lateral flow assay. So before I go into this, I just uh, wish to share some experience like uh, in certain settings like uh, we have uh, been particularly in HIV infected uh, populations and also apart from that, some other populations are also coming up with uh, this cryptococcal meningitis that is non-HIV, non-transplant patients. So we have these categories of patients and when they uh, send the CSF sample for us for, uh, I mean, testing for this cryptococcal meningitis, many times we straight away go to the lateral flow assay without doing a microscopy. So that actually is uh, discouraged. The first test should be microscopy because I'll be coming up like what can be the problem if we do the lateral flow on the first go. There can be some things like the post zone phenomenon or the antigen excess where you can get a false uh, negative result. So basically it detects the glucuronoxylomanin and the long tail capsular polysaccharide. And we have the different testing formats which are available. Lateral flow assay, latex agglutination, enzyme immune assay. Of course, uh, these days we are using the lateral flow assay. Latex agglutination also has certain drawbacks. I'll be coming in the next slide. And as you can see that there are several commercial platforms which are there, like it is the CRAG, LFA, EME, CryptoPS, Era Biology, BioRad, uh, Liming Bio, and Biosynex. So they have a, a modest sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis. Latex agglutination, of course, has a less sensitivity and modest specificity. And enzyme immunoassays, they have a very low sensitivity. So right now, the EME CRAG LFA is the most sensitive commercially available cryptococcal diagnostic test as per the several publications that have come up with the data. And it detects all the seven pathogenic cryptococcal species. This is very important. Why this test came up to be the most sensitive? Because the other platforms like the Dynamica and the Biosynex, they fail to detect these two species. One is Cryptococcus bacillus porus and Cryptococcus tetragatizer or type C. So these two fungal pathogens are quite uh, prevalent in different parts of Southeast Asia, also in Africa with high prevalence areas. So there can be false negative uh, cases in this. So as you can see, this is how the test platform or the uh, assay platform look like. It is just uh, very pretty simple and within just uh, within half an hour, we are able to get the test results. So this is the principle of how exactly the test has been developed by means of the test line control line. And also we have the conjugate pad and then we have the sample. So the performance characteristics, as you can see, it is excellent with the use of this uh, EME cryptococcal lateral flow assay with the sensitivity and specificity approaching 100% in majority of the cases. So what I was talking about, many times it has happened that we see the cryptococcus under uh, India ink and it is positive in microscopy, but the crack LFA turns out to be negative. 
So places where which are actually using only CRAG LFA for diagnosis of tryptococcal meningitis may meet such cases because there is some phenomenon called the post zone effect or the zone of antigen excess, where actually because of this hook effect, you can have a false negative uh, result in CRAG LFA. So this kit which IMI has developed that is actually a semi-quantitative CRAG LFA kit which is not available in majority of the countries even in India we don't have this kit which uh, it is not registered. So uh, it has been shown that this kit actually has several gradations or several I mean grades of this antigen which correspond to specific titers when we do the dilutions. So we have a 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 and 5 plus. So that corresponds to specific dilutions of this uh, cryptococcal antigen. And here we can get a good result. So we have seen that cases which are actually negative by CRAG LFA but positive by microscopy, they turn out to be 4 plus with this type of kit. We got one uh, kit uh, for IVD purpose only. And there we checked that actually it is 4 plus in some samples which were otherwise missed by this uh, simple CRAG LFA qualitative one. So it has a sensitivity or specificity around sensitivities around 98 percent specificity close to 96 percent. So this uh, is a bit about in a nutshell in uh, about the different uh, antigen and antibody testing platforms including the lateral flow devices. The molecular diagnostic methods I'll just uh, give a brief overview with that what all platforms we have right now. So as we know that it has a short turnaround time than conventional tests, it has a high sensitivity reproducibility, it, ha it has a high performance output and it can simultaneously identify the pathogen and not only that it can also give an idea about the antifungal resistance and it can help in identification of the cryptic and the non-culturable fungal species. It helps in early diagnosis and prompt initiation of appropriate antifungals. So basically it is all about the real time PCR. So real time PCR are the uh, only diagnostic PCR that should be used directly on clinical specimens. So quantification happens in the real time and it allows the use of an alien internal control. It has a single way workflow with dedicated rooms, so there are less chances of contamination. And the critical step for diagnostic PCR is the extraction. So the extraction method has to be standardized and it is not the same for all fungal species. In our personal experience, we know that in several species of Demetaceous fungi, the uh, commercial kits, they do not perform well, and we have to really go for this bead beating or the mechanical lysis in presence of uh, the, I mean, several enzymes to have a good extraction. And after extraction, you need to quantify the DNA. We need to check the purity of the DNA, and we need to run an agarose gel to find out the quality of the DNA and after that it is suitable for the downstream applications. So these are the different advances in PCR based assays. We have a droplet PCR that can detect as low as 4.5 DNA copies per reaction in blood and it has a very high specificity. It is particularly useful in neonatal IFIs particularly where the samples are having a very low fungal load. Then we have the T2 candida panel. This is quite uh, means uh, it is not available in majority of the settings in the US. It must be available, I'm sure. And it actually has a mean turnaround time of less than five hours, but it can detect only limited number of candida species. It is mainly recommended for the diagnosis of candidemia and has been approved by the FDA. So it can detect five species. It is Albicans, Tropicalis, Parasolosis, and Cruzia and Glebrata. So apart from these five species, which account for 95% of the cases of candidemia. It will not detect the other fungal species, but it has a limit of detection of one to three CFU per ml, which is a very high sensitivity. And it is particularly useful in deep-seated in invasive candidiasis. In deep-seated invasive candidiasis, the challenge is that we are not able to get the adequate specimen. And not only that, the organisms are actually, there is a seeding and they may be released transiently or uh, I mean, very infrequently into the bloodstream. So the time we are collecting the blood for culture, it may not be give you a positive result. So this type of assays are particularly useful when there is a deep-seated candidiasis and um, the organisms are transiently released into the bloodstream. Then we have a multiplex platform. 
where we can have a simultaneous detection of the fungal pathogen along with the antifungal resistance. So we have several commercial multiplex platforms which are available right now. We have a microfluidic or PCR on chip platform which is available, which combines. It is actually a combined uh, PCR assay, which combines a multiplex platform along with a reverse hybridization platform. And it has a simultaneously detection. It can simultaneously detect the pathogen along with the antifungal resistance. Sensitivity and specificity are fairly high in candidemia with 93 and 100% respectively. So we have another two systems in combined PCR, the EPLEX system, which is a FDA approved platform right now. And it combines microfluidics, PCR, and electrochemical detection. It detects around 16 fungal species or genera simultaneously and related resistance markers as well. So sensitivity is around 90, 9 to 100%, almost 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity for fungal pathogens. And we have the proximity ligation assay. So this combines the specificity of antigen antibody recognition with the sensitivity of a real-time PCR. So we have a sensitivity of real-time PCR plus a specificity of antigen antibody interaction, and it has a high specificity for diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis. So these are the different methods and their performance in different settings. So we have, these are the FDA approved molecular assays, which I have mentioned. Apart from this, there are several assays which I have not mentioned because it will be very elaborate and uh, very extensive. So these are the only FDA approved molecular assays which are available. Aspergenius, which is a multiplex platform. The MAC assay, MIC assay Aspergillus from the Myconostica. It is also a real time with molecular bacons. Then we have T2 Candida, Eplex, and East Traffic Light and Quick Fish. That is the PNA fish. So we have this assays already approved by the FDA. Definitely their limitations are that it is not readily available in majority of the centers. They're highly expensive and require um, uh, sophisticated equipment and reagents as well. So then we have the next generation sequencing platform. So we have a five step approach. First, we have to do the nucleic acid extraction, which is very, very important. We have to standardize it. We have to get a good quality of the DNA, particularly a high molecular weight DNA. And then we have to go for sequencing and library preparation, followed by the sequencing. And then we get the data. And there are several platforms for this sequencing. We have the PacBio, we have Illumina, we have Flowcell, and we have the uh, the, several different other platforms and also the Minion platform has now been brought up and also Oxford Nanopore sequencing. So then we have a huge range of data and after that is the analysis and finally we get the report. So next is the biosensor based final fungal diagnostic tests. We have electrochemical and optical sensors which have been brought out though they have not been approved or validated as of now but researchers indicate that actually uh, there is a detection of candida in clinical samples, which is uh, has a very high sensitivity around limit of detection 10 CFE per ml. Time to result is less than one hour and useful in invasive aspergillosis also. And optical biosensors are there for candida albicans. Also for aspergillus galactum anonine body fluids, they're trying to standardize this assay and they've seen that the uh, places where we have seen that uh, the cutoff for galactum anonine was 80 picogram. Sorry, it was uh, cut off for Aspergillus galactum and was 1 or 0.5, but right now the limit of detection is 0.4 nanogram per ml, and time to results is 10 minutes approximately. So finally, we have artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is actually taking up all the that uh, I mean comp assays into its diagnostic algorithm, and they are giving some sort of data which can be helpful for making a diagnosis. So we have basically three testing models. One is the supervised learning or task driven, where actually there is a model training phase. Then we have the manual annotation, then generating training data set. Everything of this entire thing actually works on the data set and the training model on known features. And finally, applying that model to the data. So this is supervised learning and then we have unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning so this entire thing can actually give a very valuable information uh, regarding the diagnosis of uh, ifis and not only that the patients who are more prone to develop ifis can also be given and 
we have the Raman spectra also, where artificial intelligence and Raman spectra together, they have done some fantastic work. They are still in the research phase, not in the diagnostics. So these are some recent articles that have come up regarding the uh, use of artificial intelligence in the diagnosis of invasive fungal infections. There is machine learning and artificial intelligence use of Raman spectroscopy for diagnosis. So final question is, is there a champion? So the answer is very difficult. Not a single assay can be taken as the final foolproof for the diagnosis of fungal infections. It has to be a combination of assays, particularly in patients with a high pre-test probability and along with the clinical and the radiological findings that can help in the diagnosis. So there is no foolproof 100% uh, perfect um, diagnostic biomarker that can adequately diagnose the fungal disease. It has to be a combination of the clinical, radiological, and microbiological criteria. And that is what the URTC, MSGRC, and ESHAM, they all speak about. So we have to think fungus and save lives. And here I conclude my session. So thank you very much for listening. And I hand it over to JT for the for continuing the remaining sessions. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samadar. That was that was great, uh, great um, um, overview of all of the uh, the diagnostics available, some um, being implemented and utilized and some maybe a little more in the future and things that we can look at um, going forward. So thank you for that. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to go on to the uh, the, the next uh, the next presentation um, from uh, Dr. Andre Speck. Um, and real quick, actually, uh, for those of you that have uh, maybe joined a little bit late, uh, if you do have questions for any of the pre the for any of the speakers, um, please put your questions into the Q and A section on on Teams. So um, that, that's just a little housekeeping there. Um, but yes, Dr. Andre Speck uh, is the associate professor of uh, medicine, associate director of infectious disease clinic. Uh, clinical Research Unit, uh, co-director and founder of the Invasive Mycosis Clinic um, in the Infectious D Disease Division and Department of Medicine at Washington University School of Medicine uh, here in the U.S. So um, Dr. Speck will be talking about antifungal drugs and the current armamentarium and novel agents in the pipeline. So Dr. Speck, honored to have you, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you for that. Uh, I am trying to pull up a, my slides. Do you guys see them? Yes, we see that. Okay, Thank you. Wonderful. So I'm going to talk about the uh, antifungal drugs uh, currently. Really going to touch really shortly on the, uh, the ones that are current and then talk about the novel agents in the pipeline. Uh, my research support and consulting are as you see. <clears throat> so uh, the big issue that we have here is that we've had a historically low rate of uh, novel drug development in the antifungal world uh, in the 21st century. So we're literally talking about the last 24 years. We have had one new class, which was the kind of cannons, and they kind of just barely squeak in uh, to this century. So we're talking about uh, the, the four new uh, um, kind of cannons that we've had. Uh, caspofungin, anigilofungin, mycofungin, which are really, there's variations on that drug, but for, the, for all intents and purposes, they're the same drug. Um, and then we have resifungin, uh, which is essentially long-lasting anigilofungin. So um, not a huge amount of variability within the class itself. We've had two new azoles, uh, 2006 and 2015, which means that we are now uh, approaching a decade of no new azoles uh, next year. Um, <clears throat> and we've had some new formulations of already existing azole, so we've got extended release pozoconazole, IV pozoconazole, subitriconazole, things like that. Uh, but really, we haven't seen an explosion of new antifungals lately. What does that leave us with? So what is the, the lay of the land, the, the, the status quo that we're working with right now? So we have three classes of antifungals. Uh, if we're talking about really kind of systemic antifungals, uh, terbenafine is there, 5-HC are still are, are there, the, they are systemic drugs. 
but they're not really systemic drugs that we use for monotherapy for invasive disease. They're used as add-on therapies for complicated diseases. Um, <clears throat> of those three primary classes of antifungals, uh, they target only two pathways. Uh, only one of the three classes is oral. One is very toxic, and the oral class is actually still pretty toxic. Um, you know, we talk about azoles not being all that toxic, but that's only because we're comparing them to uh, amphotericin. Um, and we're really kind of comparing it to amphotericin deoxycholate in our minds a lot of times when we discuss the toxicity. Um, because I run into, you know, boriconazole and things like that, we run into really high levels of toxicity all along. So let's talk about some of the, the cool stuff that's, that's coming down the pike. And I'm going to try to make this relatively quick in the interest of time. So novel agents. The first one we're going to talk about is Ibrexa fungerp. Um, the names on some of these are pretty terrible. Uh, they are tongue twisters and tongue breakers. Um, so what is Ibrexa fungerp? It's a novel class. Uh, they're called Impuma fungins. Often they're referred to as oral uh, ichemicandins. And the reason that they're referred to as oral ichemicandins is because they're oral beta-glucan synthase inhibitors. So this is a, a novel class of uh, drugs that are much, much smaller uh, chemically than the kind of cannons, but they attack the exact same uh, target in the um, fungal pathways. Um, and, and as a result of being smaller, they're orally bioavailable. Uh, they're active against kind of cannon resistant Canada, uh, which is really important is that as we have a global rise of that particular entity in both Labrada and Oris and a few other species. Um, <clears throat> The IV formulation of Ibrexafungrip is not likely to be marketed anytime soon. Um, it, they're currently working on the fourth formulation, I believe, uh, of trying to make it work as an IV. There is work on, uh, undergoing, but uh, as of right now, it looks like it's a PO only. Um, it's active against Canada, Aspergillus, PJP, uh, Lamentospora prolificans. Maybe active against amorphic molds. It appears to have activity. Um, I am not familiar with any. Um, <clears throat> actual in patient treatment of dimorphic molds uh, because most people are pretty concerned because of the classic teaching that beta beagle can is not expressed in endemics uh, in the yeast phase. However, that, that appears to be not true because it tests positive by beta beagle can, but nonetheless. Um, it has a vi very high volume of distribution and high tissue penetration. Um, what's really interesting to it is it, is it concentrates inside of acidic tissue. So it concentrates in things like vaginal secretions. And more interestingly for us, who do deal a lot with um, invasive candida, uh, is that it concentrates inside of abscesses. So the concentrations inside of a liver abscess are about 100 times that of blood. So they might be, this might be a really good drug for sterilizing abscesses or maybe even the kind of micro abscess syndromes such as the uh, hepatosplenic candidiasis. Uh, this might be kind of a drug almost uh, tailor-made for that. We have no data on hepatosplenic candidiasis at this time. This is just me speculating. So, um, Also, there's no penetration in the brain and eye, which is not something that we are too surprised by many of our drugs, unfortunately. Um, current areas of study, it's being studied for invasive candidiasis. Uh, it's in a phase three. Uh, Add-on therapy for aspergillus in phase two. VVC, uh, it was approved uh, for, uh, for VVC under Brexafem as the brand name. One thing that is important for us to kind of note here is that the, is the dosing is very different for VVC. So even though it's approved for VVC, you can't really use it off-label for the other things. Um, <clears throat> and currently, uh, worldwide, it is not you cannot get access to Brexa Funger, even for a clinical trial. And that's because it's nothing to do with the company. The company didn't do anything wrong. It's nothing to do with the drug. It's not, they didn't do anything wrong. Um, what happened was uh, the FDA created a new rule that any drug, any line, so assembly line for drugs that is used for creating beta lactams can only be used for creating beta lactams. And it turns out the line that there was that the manufacturer manufacturer was using to make Ibrexa funger, which was a contractor manufacturer, was also being used to make beta, uh, beta lactams, and they never informed the company until the FDA, until they were inspected by the USDA, and found that turns out they're violating this rule, and they, as a result, the USDA, you know, confiscated all of uh, Ibrexa funger out in the market. There was never a case, there was no signal, there's no concern about 
cross reactivity. This is just a new rule that was implemented based on nothing that we know of. And uh, it kind of killed, it's, it's kind of shut down the ability for us to access the drug for the last like six months almost. Um, likely future therapy is, is step down therapy in Canada, uh, especially resistant isolates, um, maybe for abscess treatment. Um, and then there's also this idea of azole synergy and aspergillus. Uh, I think the MARS study made us really all interested in, in the possibility of that being a, a, a helpful approach for many patients. So let's talk about phosphanogepics, and these are the two with the worst names. The, the rest of the names get better. Um, <clears throat> So phosphonogepix is previously known as APX001. It's an inhibitor of GWT1, which is a GPI anchor protein, um, GPI anchor protein synthesis protein. Um, and what it does is it destabilizes the cell wall. So it destabilizes the structure of the, of the fungus. And by destabilizing the cell wall, it unmasks the cell membrane, uh, which has a lot more uh, immune epitopes than the masked cell wall uh, to the immune system, which hopefully kind of increases the, the synergy between the immune system and, and, and the drug. Um, it has less toxicity than some of the other drugs. So there, should, there are no on-target effects specifically because there's no mammalian analog because um, we don't have cell walls. Uh, it's available as PO and IV. Uh, phase three for IC was on hold for a while because Pfizer bought the asset um, from Amplex and then promptly, you know, decided to rev up a massive research protocols. And then within, before the research protocols actually got off the ground, they decided to dump the asset. Um, and they've just sold the, uh, the, the drug. Uh, <clears throat> and so the company is now the owner and they're starting the phase three for invasive candidiasis soon. It has orphan drug status for invasive candidiasis, invasive aspergillosis, coxie, and rare molds, including uh, Scutosporium and Fusarium. And we presented some work at uh, ECMIN a couple of years ago of 70% success rate with Fusarium, which is pretty remarkable. And it's kind of where the drug appears to be carving out a really interesting niche is with Fusarium. Uh, cool, th interesting things about the drug, it's 90% bioavailable, has very broad spectrum of activity. Uh, Canada, Oris, uh, Canada, including Canada Oris, uh, Crypto, Coxy, Aspergillus, Mucoralis, Fusarium, Mementospora. What it does completely lack activity against is Cruzii, so it will not cover Cruzii. Um, it's active against fluconazole and kind of can resistant isolates. Uh, it's an extensive tissue distribution, including liver, lung, brain, and eye. So this is good. It gets in the brain and eye. So we can actually kind of treat um, uh, brain, uh, brain abscesses as well as uh, endophthalmitis. It doesn't really tend to get into the urine, unfortunately, which is just another giant hole that we have with uh, fungal drugs is, is access into the urine. Um, and it has biliary excretion. <clears throat> uh, possible future roles, broad antifungal for use of both IV and PO. The trials ongoing and planned are pretty wide. Um, it, some of these things are gonna be hard to actually have a clinical trial, but we, we should be hopefully seeing some data in the next few years. Um, next one I'm gonna talk about is infiltrated infotericin B. There is no doubt that I am a, a big fanboy of amphotericin. I think amphotericin is still the best antifungal we've ever created. Um, the main problem with amphotericin is that it's also a pretty good anti-human. Uh, so if it was, if we could just make it less, less good of an anti-human and preserve the antifungal activity, we would probably have um, kind of a, a workhorse in our, uh, even more of a workhorse in our alimentarium. So, encoclated amphotericin B is a novel delivery mechanism for amphotericin B, which allows for oral dosing. So this is a really big deal. Allows for oral dosing. And it allows us to push the dose. So, the doses that we've played with have been 25 and 50 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, the li limit, what limits our ability to dose this drug is actually not uh, the classic amphotericin toxicities of infusion and uh, kidney failure. Uh, or hemolysis in, in some cases. What limits our ability to infuse this is actually GI side effects. So people get diarrhea and nausea just because they're give, we're giving them a pretty large fat load. Um, and the way this word essentially works is it's a lipid uh, sheet, <clears throat> which in a low calcium environment, um, essentially uh, rolls up as a sheet and traps the drug inside. Um, this is, um, sorry, this, and then what happens is it gets, phagos, it gets it goes into our body 
goes uh, up through the lymphatic system, uh, through the thoracic duct, and enters the blood as uh, intact uh, capsules or, or cochlea, I think is the, the technical term, but to me it looks like a Persian rug. And uh, once they are um, consumed by either uh, uh, APCs, so engine presenting cells will consume these, uh, they will bring them into the lysosome, into their phagolysosome. The phagolysosome has a very low pH, low calcium environment, which leads to the unraveling of this uh, structure, which then releases the drug. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we have a release of the drug in the area of the infection. The fungus will also be the one to consume it. And we can see that really, really push the doses pretty high uh, and seems to be working a little bit, quite a bit better than deoxycholate in uh, patients. <clears throat> Kidneys are protected because there's minimal free drug, even at the high doses of 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram. Um, so we've, I mentioned some of this stuff. There is currently some, some currently it's unclear where the development's going. If the biggest uh, location appears to be in the uh, cryptococcal world in, in Africa with David Bulware. Uh, and it's really kind of driven, I think, a lot of ways by funding. Um, let's talk, and then the other thing we're going to talk about is olorafen. Uh, olorafen is a, is a drug that's currently up uh, for evaluation by the FDA with phase two data, no phase three yet, uh, which is currently unrolling, but uh, it is a drug that's active against dihydroorotate dehydrogenase, so DHODH, uh, which inhibits DNA synthesis. So the way I like to talk to people about this is to think of it as Bactrim for fungus. So you know, it's a, it's a folate synthase inhibitor. Um, it binds against mammalian analog, uh, but it's, it's 20,000 times lower than the binding uh, to the fungal analog, which really means there's actually no activity. Um, no on, on, on site or, or no, on, um, no, no toxicity directly to um, on effect. Uh, orally, it's bioavailable. Uh, it's wide tissue distribution, including the brain and synovium. Uh, again, doesn't get into the urine. Um, orphan drug status in, for invasive aspergillosis and lamentospora. It has really good activity against highland hypomyces, the mediaceous molds, and morphic molds. It's, again, it's, again, it's active against resistant strains, including pan-resistant molds like Spedosporium, lamentospora, and Scopularyopsis brumtii, I and mean, really, truly wonderful activity. And it has no activity against yeast and Nicaragua. That's a big hole for it. Um, one thing that's really important to note is that if you incubate um, molds with drugs most of the time what ends up happening is you see them start to get a uh, funny shape it doesn't really tend to kill them in vitro because molds are pretty resistant so this is actually a time-lapse video of uh, olorafen incubated with aspergillus and what you're going to see is over time it grows and then it starts to get deformed a little bit uh, which is really unusual and then it pops and then another cell pops, is about to pop. And if you actually watch this, if we actually uh, had this uh, for another 24 hours or so, you will see a significant, uh, the rest of the cells uh, pop, which is again, really unusual and leads to such cytotoxic activity, it's really interesting, as well as really wonderful uh, patient responses that we've been seeing uh, for rare, mold, rare resistant molds and for coxy. Um, it's really hard to induce resistance. Uh, phase three for aspergillus is underway. Uh, there is a hepatotoxicity signal, so about 2% uh, or so of people appear to have a significant hepatotoxicity event. Most of the time, you're able to get away with it just by changing the dosing. And so I'm going to just really give you a quick example of a patient we had the pleasure of taking care of. This is a 60-year-old lung transplant patient, airway obstruction due to infection at an stomach site uh, with uh, scopularyopsis brumtii. Uh, five weeks of combination therapy of prosopagnol, castrofungin, and trebenafin have done nothing, uh, and the airway uh, obstruction persists. So basically, what's happening at this point is that the lung transplant doctors are going in twice a week and manually debriding using a laser uh, this anastomotic site in order to open up passage, uh, because otherwise, it is basically the patient starts to suffocate. Um, this is and this is what it looks like on day minus four, so four days before we start drug. Um, we start uh, olorafem as monotherapy on day 10. There is virtually no, no infection there. There is definitely some plaques and ulcerations, but definitely looks much improved compared to day minus four. And then by day 26, which is really just two, day, two weeks after that, so a total of three and a half, almost four weeks, 
uh, after the initiation of drug, the airway is open. There is no disease there. The patient did continue on significantly more therapy just to make, prevent relapse. Uh, but really, we kind of had a, a curative event uh, really early in therapy after failing multiple, over a month of combined therapy. So in summary, there are limited options for many fungal infections. There are more treatments in development than ever before, which is really remarkable. Uh, many have better safety profiles. Many cover holes in the current materium. Many actually do both. But as long as the development continues, the future actually looks really bright. And what's really most important to me now is that there's very few patients that I have in my clinic who I can't think of a salvage option for, which was very different uh, seven or eight years ago, where, I, where a good swath of these heavily complicated patients who have been uh, referred to us as kind of a quaternary service, which is, you know, even, even other academic centers refer to us all the time, um, we would kind of see these patients and say, I, I got nothing for you, um, and I'm sorry. Uh, so that's actually gotten pretty rare, at least from the antifungal side. Um, if you want to learn more about this, there are about a dozen other compounds that are of in development and worth reading about. Uh, there's a wonderful article that was written by one of my mentees, and, and really, I, I, I've taken, I am on the author on the paper, but really, it's 99% her effort, uh, Adriana Rosseo, uh, available uh, open access at OFID. So it's uh, called Hope on the Horizon, Not Novel Fungal Treatments in Development. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's definitely worth a read. It's a it's a bit of a big paper. It's almost ten thousand words, uh, but it is if you want to learn more about this, I think that's a good place to start. Um, and so with that, I will turn over to JT and hopefully um, provide some. Uh, we've got some time. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Speck. Um, yeah, very. Um, exciting things i think in the in the in the pipeline in the future and and i, I like your your phrase of making things less anti-human and the the oral uh dosing of amphotericin b that's that's an exciting um pathway forward i think so um i think for we'll we'll save some of the questions for our our last little uh q and a session and we'll we'll move on to our our final presenter of our final presentation here with uh, uh, Dr. Alexandre Alanio. Um, he is a professor at University of Paris City, heading uh, the Mycology Parasitology Laboratory at Hospital St. Louis in Paris, and a deputy director of the French National Reference Center for Mycosis and Antifungals. And he will be uh, presenting on the antifungal resistance mechanisms their laboratory detection and clinical imp implications. So, Dr. Alanio, thank you. Uh, honored to have you um, like the others, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, JT. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen uh, um, and full screen. Is it okay for you? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, hit the um, presentation mode uh, screen. Uh. Uh, we can see your slides. It's it just okay. In the, yeah, I there we see go. It. Okay. Uh, Great. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. So I will I will talk about um, uh, resistance mechanism and uh, and how we detected it, and then uh, uh, try to give you some insights in the uh, what, what is the clinical implication of that. So. Um, Sorry, I have to 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 uh, go back to this very very important slide for uh, my point of view is um, when you analyze the main causes of uh, of uh, therapeutic failure, there is always um, and it is particularly true for uh, invasive fungal infections. Always the three components. The first one is the host, of course. If the host is still neutropenic, you know you will be very uh, it will be very difficult to, to treat uh, completely the infection if the neutropenia is not uh, uh, so that at one point, uh, I mean, uh, for example, uh, during aspergillosis. So the, the host immune status is something very important. Um, if you have material also, you will be uh, uh, having hard time to, to, to clean, to clear the infection. And depending on the site, uh, it will also be very difficult. 
Um, then uh, after that, you have drug, the drug. So what 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 kind of drug do you um, um, do you use? Um, uh, do you have a good level of drug uh, in the blood? There, is there any uh, drug interactions? Um, uh, so you really need to to um, to have levels of this drug uh, to, to be sure that the, the patient get the, the right concentration in the blood to fight the infection. So that's that's very important. And the other one is, of course, the fungus side. And uh, the, the fungal side means um, could be resistance to the antifungal drug or could be um, in a very high uh, load, meaning that you will... Uh, Take, it will take time to really get rid of all the fungus uh, by the antifungal drug, even if, if there is no resistance. So all those um, um, all those uh, components are very important to take into account when you are dealing with a patient and uh, with uh, a suspicion of uh, of failure. So going back to uh, basics uh, um, about resistance. So there is uh, two different kind of resistance, uh, intrinsic resistance, meaning that all the population um, is uh, resistant to a given antifungal drug. And very rarely you have uh, one, one isolate that is sensitive. Uh, but this is um, mainly due to the genetics of the organism, to the evolution of the organism, uh, having a specific and um, uh, a specific sequence of the target that prevents the antifungal drug to, uh, to, to bind and then to be active. So this is the case for uh, Tereus and Amphotericin B, for example, uh, Lantulus and uh, Azol drug, um, Emiristella quadrilineata and Echidocondins for the, the, um, for the Aspergillae. Then in terms of uh, acquired resistance, this is the opposite. So you have mainly um, a susceptible population and, um, and, and sometimes you have some emergence of resistance for some specific strains and specific settings that are acquired by modification of the target under or after exposure to the drug. So this is the case for Aspergillus fumigatus and azole drugs because uh, the main population is susceptible to azoles, but uh, in specific settings, and we will go back to that after that, you will be able to see the emergence of resistance uh, because of pre-exposure from uh, uh, antifungal drugs or uh, uh, or uh, pesticides in the environment. Um, but in terms of aspergillus, not much um, uh, acquired resistance, and we will go back to that. Uh, uh, one important point is um, still the identify, doing the right and, and really accurate identification of, of your isolate is very important. And why is that? Because uh, you may know that at least in uh, Aspergillus, but in many other uh, genera, um, you have cryptic species. And those cryptic species, uh, they are now called species because uh, they have a different um, behavior um, when you uh, expose those uh, species to antifungal drug, meaning that some of them are intrinsically resistant to uh, those drugs. This is the case for Lentulus, for example, the case for other cryptic species. I won't go into the details of uh, all of them. But um, obviously, uh, if you do the identification, you will be able to predict that this specific isolate of this specific species or cryptic species uh, will be potentially resistant to antifungal drug because of interesting resistance. Then goes the, you have here all the mechanisms that have been summarized nicely in this um, in this specific um, um, uh, review. So many uh, many kind of uh, mechanisms involving many cellular compartments of the fungus and. Uh, uh, many drugs, I would say, uh, because not all the drugs uh, can be affected by all the mechanisms. So first, um, uh, biofilm formation uh, in the upper right here, biofilm formation is a way for some fungi, especially candida in, um, in uh, uh, material, for example, um, can resist or can tolerate better the antifungal drug so that then they, they are more 
tolerant to it and so they are able to um, uh, to disseminate or to reactivate uh, um, uh, as a planktonic um, uh, cell afterwards. Loss of uh, mitochondrial function, I won't go into the details, but it's associated to increased to azole, azole uh, resistance. This is uh, well described for uh, Candida glabrata, for example. Uh, stress signaling is also in, involved in uh, increased uh, caspo or uh, fluconazole tolerance. So we are talking here about tolerance more than uh, fully resistance. Um, uh, mutations, of course, mutations in the in in the target, meaning in the target of azole drugs or in the target of um, echinocondins, uh, will lead at one point to, uh, if the mutation is really at the site of binding, will lead to uh, inefficacy of um, uh, no efficacy of of the of the drug to this uh, specific uh, strain. Um, uh, more complex to study, but still existing, and, and this is uh, still true for uh, many other many fungi, um, uh, yeasts and, and aspergillus, uh, the increase of uh, drug efflux by specific pumps and, and the uh, increase of the transcription of those, uh, of those transporters uh, from different origins, meaning uh, because of the increase of a specific uh, uh, transcription factor or, or others, uh, will lead to the decrease of the concentration of the drug inside the cell, and so um, and so the inefficacy of of the drug because no uh, then no no not enough drug inside the cell to inhibit the the target. Um, uh, upregulation and mutation of uh, target genes in ergosterol biosynthesis. This is uh, clearly true for Aspergillus fumigatus um, um, uh, and uh, increasing um, azole resistance. As you know, increasing the number of targets will also uh, allow the fungus to still have a function of this specific target because of the very high level of, the, of this ta uh, target as compared to the inhibition of the drug. And then uh, lipid metabolic bypass also is, uh, has been described uh, as a, 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 a way to uh, increase resistance to azoles and, and polyens, but it's still a more complicated uh, a way to, to describe this, uh, these uh, mechanisms. Outside this, um, I did not mention, sorry, I did not mention also uh, resistance to 5-FC, which is uh, important to mention for specifically for uh, complicated yeast uh, or uh, endocarditis, for example, which sometimes is, is very important uh, drug to, to treat those uh, candida very disseminated candida infections. Uh, and, and, and resistance to 5-FC is known to um, really be related to uh, the, um, uh, this kind of, um, of um, inhibition of a mutation in the, in the enzyme uh, that is uh, processing the 5-FC to uh, 5-FU that is really inhibiting protein synthase and, and DNA synthesis. So here you, you will get 5-FC uh, resistance. Outside this, uh, there is many uh, other factors that could influence the acquisition of resistance, uh, especially in the environment, uh, where the uh, those fungi are exposed to many other factors than um, uh, antifungal drugs, uh, but still uh, they are selected for some specific phenotypes that could be really uh, involved uh, impacting the, the the phenotype of resistance uh, in the end so for example it is well known for crypto um, but the aneuploidy meaning the different the, 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 the different number of of chromosomes or different number of parts of the chromosomes like duplications they are really associated with an increase of uh, resistance it has been well described with crypto and fluconazole with the duplication of chromosome one which carries um, um, uh, erg 11 and also uh, like an efflux pump so it's clearly uh, clearly something that is possible, and we know that many fungi are able to uh, to be to 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 allow this aneuploidy, like diploidy or aneuploidy, uh, complete aneuploidy. Then uh, something that has been described quite recently is uh, mutations or um, 
uh, decreased efficacy of um, molecules that, uh, or proteins, sorry, or enzymes that are able to repair the DNA. And when you don't repair the DNA correctly in any uh, biological organism, uh, you will introduce mutations. And that's why a lot of uh, uh, viruses are really having derives in terms of genetics because of this um, the, the, the performances of those uh, repair uh, proteins that will introduce um, at each cycle uh, mutations in specific parts which will generate um, a kind of uh, variability kind of diversity which will at one point potentially um, um, impact uh, drugs and 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 mainly um, enzymes uh, target target uh, target genes uh, for antifungal drugs um, something that I, uh, I, I I that is important is also the way that in the environment uh, fungi are interacting with other fungi they are doing sexual reproduction they are doing parasexual reproduction um, they are uh, potentially uh, uh, producing heterokaryons that will um, uh, mix all the, the, the genetic material uh, from another individual to another and, and will be potentially uh, able to generate again diversity and, and by diversity potential um, uh, mutations in, uh, in uh, target genes. Of course, the UVs, uh, UVs uh, will uh, produce uh, mutations. This is clearly known. Even if some fungi have uh, melanins to, pro to to really protect against UVs, this can be uh, this can be a way uh, the, to generate uh, mutations also in the genome. And, and you still have uh, phenotypic plasticity uh, and, and population dynamics that will help um, at one point some individual cells to maintain or to increase tolerance to antifungal drugs and this is particularly uh, true uh, these days and i'm working on this and i'm happy to see papers on this specific topic uh, especially in cryptococcus where here you have two nice papers describing um, uh, what is persister in the end persisters uh, persister cells in cryptococcus in uh, after exposure to amphotericin b uh, two different models, so mainly in vitro and the uh, other paper uh, uh, in vivo, uh, um, trying to understand um, what are the determinants of um, the generation of those cells that are resistant to amphotericin B exposure, or at least uh, tolerant, not resistant, because um, persistence, uh, tolerance, and uh, resistance uh, are still uh, are quite different. So the idea with uh, persist with persister cells is that they are. Uh, a few cells that are able to resist to antifungal drug um, for with some specific mechanism, mainly probably efflux pumps um, or other genes that needs to be discovered. Um, and um, those um, uh, those cells will be able, after removal of the of the amphotericin B, to generate again a population of cells that are sensitive and a few number of cells that are still resistant. Uh, and this is more a uh, populational approach that uh, helps understanding this, uh, this, this phenomenon. True, the same uh, with uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where uh, it has been described in Amphotericin B persistence uh, to the, to, to uh, yeah, in Saccharomyces uh, uh, dealing with biofilm and planktonic cells. Um, then um, let me go for um, the impact of a drug uh, on on the on, on the bugs. So uh, we did something in France uh, for a long time now, uh, taking advantage of the reference center, uh, trying to address the the, the effect on uh, not only azole but all let's say azole plus echinocondin uh, drug pre exposure on the recurrent episodes. So if you start with incident episodes of um, candidemia here, you see the proportion of what we have in France, uh, candida albicans, 50% uh, of the cases, then glabrata, parapsilosis tropicalis, and rare species, um, uh, cruzii and rare species. And when you give uh, antifungal drug for 
some reason. It can be to treat uh, 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 candidiasis, it can be to treat aspergillosis, and then you have candidiasis or a recurrent candidiasis, and you will you will get a, a different proportion of, of those uh, organisms. And especially here for azole, azole exposure, you will uh, decrease the, the proportion of uh, candida albicans. Um, glabrata will not change so much, uh, but you will increase uh, parapsilosis uh, tropicalis a little bit, and, and you will increase clearly rare or mixed species because uh, most of them uh, are uh, intrinsically resistant to, to fluconazole. But when we looked at, uh, in France, the effect of um, um, the, the usage of uh, fluconazole over time uh, with pre-exposure or, or, or pre-exposure to echinocondine or to fluconazole, uh, we did not see much uh, an, an increase in the, in the proportion of resistance over time. Uh, also, the the, 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 there was a clear increase in the in the in the prescriptions of echinocondines over time, which is normal because the drug was available at the time. And and despite this increase of um, of the use uh, in France, at least we were not able to see a, a very clear increase of uh, the proportion of uh, the drug um, of the resistance to to the drug. So in the end, uh, from uh, uh, 2,661 uh, isolates, we were only able to see uh, 20, something like 20 um, uh, isolates that were uh, resistant to echinocondines, meaning that acquired resistance uh, after echinocondine treatment. So it happens, it happens in specific. So we are dealing here with candidemia only. Uh, when you are dealing with um, invasive candidiasis, the story is is different, and and uh, many many centers, especially in the U.S., described um, sometimes a rate of antifungal uh, resistance for echinocondines up to 25%, uh, which is uh, sometimes very important, and mainly relating on on um, on this kind of um, uh, invasive candidiasis outside candidemia. So if I can summary what we have um, in terms of uh, Im important facts uh, again uh, at uh, for for uh, acquired resistance um, so Important bugs are Candida glabrata, parapsilosis, Candida auris, uh, of course, uh, Trichoderma, um, uh, Trichophyton you, you, you know, we, I, will, I will discuss a little bit about that uh, dermatophyte, and Aspergillus fumigatus. You see that um, the most um, impacted class is uh, azole drugs, uh, not much polyens, and um, here you have reports of 15% uh, uh, in specific uh, review papers of resistance to polyens, but it tends to um, probably to decrease a little bit because uh, there was an issue about uh, 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 breakpoints uh, and specific um, and specific methodology, uh, and potentially the, the percentage of resistance is a little bit uh, lower. In terms of uh, echinocondines, uh, still it's still not so frequent, but it uh, it appears, and it's uh, in France less than one percent. In the if you look at uh, EU, um, can be up to nine percent, and and in the US can be up to twenty five percent, as as I said. Um, um, fluconazole and uh, sorry, flu flucytosine is uh, you can also see some resistance uh, with Candida auris. Um, in Candida, um, in Candida glabrata and, and tropicalis, we have uh, checked that uh, long time ago, and we have a clone or clones that are circulating at least in France and in Europe um, with uh, resistance to fusitosine. But um, this is more an epidemiological fact than than very important for the treatment of the patient. Some something quite important these days are the resistance of uh, uh, azole drugs uh, in candida parapsilosis, especially fluconazole, uh, with um, a description of um, uh, many outbreaks and uh, uh, diffusions of specific clones um, in in some settings in some countries. And for uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, obviously um, there is. It's a very high variation between centers uh, in the world and uh, can be up to 26 or 30% of, uh, of resistance in specific 
um, in specific centers. But globally speaking, uh, the numbers uh, we have from global uh, studies is around uh, three to to five percent of resistance. So Glabrata, Glabrata here you have data from my center in France where we looked at uh, fluconazole and echinoconine resistance, 15% uh, fluconazole resistance, 0.7% uh, echinoconine resistance. Um, uh, we found that those who were resistant to uh, fluconazole were uh, the isolates where the patient had been treated previously. So significant association between the treatment with another drug, meaning mainly voriconazole or posaconazole for prophylaxis or for treating aspergillosis, for example. And, and if the patient is doing, um, if the patient is having a, a candida glabrata, it increases the chance to have a resistant ones because of this azole exposure. Um, we were interested in looking at uh, the uh, MSH2 mutations in the, those um, uh, mismatch repair uh, uh, gene and we uh, machinery, and we were not able to find any association between MSH2 mutation and uh, resistance to fluconazole or echinocondins. Uh, and we got one case of uh, increased uh, kinocondin um, MICs in uh, in our in our study uh, that acquired mutation uh, after seven days of uh, kinocondin in a patient with um, uh, burn lesions. Then we followed uh, in the frame of uh, one um, uh, specific uh, survey um, and study between France and Germany. We, we looked at uh, Candida glabrata candidemia uh, in three years, uh, 20, 20 to 22, uh, and we were able to collect uh, quite a lot of data from uh, at least from France and, and Germany. Um, and I, I show you here some data on France uh, data, um, only bloodstream infections. Um, uh, glabrata representing 17% uh, of the cases. Uh, nothing special in terms of uh, patients and um, information of, uh, you know, hospitalization. 33% in the ICU. Um, and here are the the, 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 the main um, MICs obtained from the main drugs that are screened in France in different centers. So uh, MICs done in the specific uh, centers, so 31 centers involved, um, and mainly using uh, e-tests. And uh, you see here that we have globally um, the distribution of what is known in the literature with uh, e-tests. I won't go into the details of everything, but globally, uh, the rate of resistance uh, dependent was dependent on the threshold. Of course, that's always the case. So which threshold you are using? If you are using the CLSI threshold, which is the one that is recommended by uh, E-tests, um, the, the, the rate of resistance was 22% for the fluconazole. And uh, and um, and if you are using the UCAS method uh, with, this, with the E-test, which is not uh, perfect, uh, the, 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 the resistance is increasing a little bit. Then you can have also e coughs calculated for e-tests uh, and using um, specific e coughs um, you can have a rate of resistance around 15% uh, uh, with uh, e cough 95%. In terms of uh, echinocondins, the rate is also variable depending on the drug, depending on the threshold, but globally speaking, um, uh, we have a um, rate of, uh, let's say, uh, 5 to 10 percent maximum, uh, depending on, on the setting. So, then for parapsilosis, you know that that's a second species isolated from candidemia in many in many countries, not in France, but in Italy, Spain, Latin America. It's a skin commensal, and 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 there was a description of a transcription nosocomial transcription uh, transmission um, of uh, candida parapsilosis, uh, especially in the ICU. And in France, we are facing um, uh, some ICUs that are. Um, uh, facing regularly, on a regular basis, uh, cases of uh, fluconazole resistant parapsilosis. And we think that this is really uh, where um, there's a niche of, 
of uh, the bug that is transmitted locally. Um, uh, and we did not, yeah, for some reason um, that has not been clearly investigated, but it's it has been described in, in many other countries. Um, uh, so in the US, if you are looking at the uh, bloodstream infections, 5.8% uh, of the parapsilosis uh, BSI are due to fluconazole resistance. Uh, and more in South Africa, it's really a real problem because you have more than 50% of the isolates that, that really are resistant. And the main mechanism of uh, azole resistance is based on two well-known mutations um, that are described here. Uh, here is the global map of, uh, of this rate of resistance. On the, on the right, you see the percentage, very high percentage in uh, South, um, uh, South Africa. Uh, and in the end, in India also, and and uh, other countries of the of the Middle East. Um, there, there was a nice um, nice paper uh, summarizing uh, all what was known on on candida parapsilosis and resistance to fluconazole. Here you have the mechanisms that are playing a role in resistance. So mainly, as in uh, candida albicans, uh, mainly efflux pump uh, that are um, overexpressed by different mechanisms. Um, the efflux, the, the overexpression of the target is also playing a role and mutation of the target, uh, of course. Then something interesting is also the heteroresistance that has been described in, um, in candida parapsilosis, meaning only part of the population uh, described the resistant phenotype that can be transient meaning that in these specific uh, uh, cells that uh, get resistance to, to, the, to the drug, uh, mechanism of resistance is playing a role in the resistance and then, uh, and then that can be transient and go back to normal if, uh, if the pressure is, uh, is less important. This is true also for uh, Candida glabrata. Then, of course, Candida auris is very important in terms of uh, resistance. Um, uh, emerged recently, I won't go into the details. Uh, the same here, intra-hospital transmissions, uh, a lot of nursing homes, uh, transmission in nursing homes in the US. Um, and, and, and in the end, when you have outbreaks uh, with uh, specific uh, strain or, or, or clade, uh, the outbreak is is really impacted by by the fact that the first strain is uh, can be resistant to to many antifungal drugs or not. Um, uh, so multi drug resistance seems to be rare. So uh, not all the cases uh, have uh, multi drug resistant, uh, but still uh, still it exists, and we know that. Uh, Candida auris is, is acquiring uh, uh, mutations quite quite easily uh, for at least for for fluconazole and uh, echinocandids. So the the, the mutations uh, in playing a role here uh, are quite well known, uh, uh, the same as uh, as other organisms, and uh, and can be checked by uh, by sequencing. So in France, we did not have any uh, case with uh, echinocandine resistance yet. Um, but we hope that it will not be um, not be imported. Here I give you two examples of uh, what can happen uh, under antifungal therapy. In uh, here a report from Kuwait dealing with uh, Candida auris in a specific area and specific patients over time, where uh, you can describe uh, the acquisition of uh, resistance, especially to echinocandines, upon echinocandine treatment. Uh, with a well description of acquisition of new mutations or different mutations for a given uh, case. Uh, I'm, I'm here with uh, patient 51 where you see the first isolate is uh, Y type and the second one uh, get a, a specific mutation and in the end another mutation uh, giving a high level of resistance to, um, uh, to echinocandines. Um, I have to say that it's, um, it's clear that there's, uh, there's a relationship between uh, uh, the presence of uh, candida auris and urine. Uh, and if you give really uh, anti echinocandines, uh, to treat a urinary tract infection, it will be difficult because uh, we know that uh, uh, echinocondines are not really well penetrating in, in the urinary tract and in the urines, which means that 
um, it can be a niche for uh, candida always to be less exposed to antifungal drug uh, to echinocondins and then to um, uh, really uh, uh, improve uh, um, the the tendency to 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 generate mutations and and to get resistant uh, in the end so then for trichophyton in dotine a we you know that uh, the main problem of this uh, recently described uh, bug and dermatophyte is uh, it's resistant to um, uh, to terbinafine and potentially azol drugs also so you have here trichophyton rubrum versus in uh, the resistance to terbinafine has already been described also in trichophyton rubrum but now we have a UCAS methodology that enables to have a cutoff and uh, 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 and to interpret uh, those um, those MICs, uh, but clearly uh, Indotine is uh, really disseminating all over the world over the, the last uh, ten years, and, and and you will continue. Uh, and the main problem is this uh, terbidafin resistance or uh, even the azol resistance, which is not uh, easy to uh, to to treat, and 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 uh, makes a lot of problem for these uh, kind of patients. And we still have to to work on how to to deal with these uh, specific cases. Um, something I would like to mention here is uh, a recent uh, outbreak of uh, Loderomyces elongisporus in the neonatal uh, ICU uh, in in Delhi with a nice nice work from uh, uh, from uh, our colleague uh, Shodari uh, showing uh, um, that uh, this kind of um, of organism, which is uh, sometimes rare, uh, can also acquire resistance. Here you have a preconazole resistance acquisition in the environment where the uh, Loderomyces have been found in apples like um, like in uh, Candida auris. Uh, and most importantly, here they found that um, this organism uh, was able to be resistant to uh, to bleach. And resistant to bleach is, uh, can pose a problem because bleach is uh, used in many centers to uh, to clean the surfaces at the in the hospital. So obviously, uh, resistance to to these uh, antiseptics or, or to um, uh, bleach can be uh, something to look at in the future. So then going back to uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, we know that um, uh, there is many mutations ongoing uh, able to produce uh, resistance to, to azole drugs uh, and two main uh, routes of, uh, of uh, resistance. The patient route, meaning that the patient has uh, aspergillosis and sometimes mainly, uh, uh, um, I would say, mainly um, chronic aspergillosis uh, under uh, triazole therapy that will uh, that will really uh, evolve towards the acquisition of mutations under um, uh, under treatment. Uh, and you have the environmental route, which means that you get exposed to some isolates that uh, acquired, uh, or at least their ancestors, acquired resistance uh, to pesticides that were um, uh, spread in the environment and not for Aspergillus fumigatus, but for other fungi, but fumigatus was here and was able to uh, maintain this mutation uh, without any fitness cost and and, and still um, uh, um, recombine or, or have sexuality with other organisms and then potentially disseminate those uh, genes in the, popu in, the, in, the, in the population. And for example, in, 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 uh, uh, in the Netherlands, um, the rate of resistance in the environment can be very important up to 10% uh, of the of the isolates. Uh, not much resistance to, to polyene or to echinocondins for, for Aspergillus fumigatus. And, um, and here, going back to new drugs, uh, this uh, this team of uh, Paul Vervej they described and tried to to understand if uh, olorofim will be able to to uh, to be impacted by uh, by mutations or uh, by treatment and and so they exposed uh, fumigators to olorofim versus uh, voriconazole or etraconazole and they checked the percentage of uh, resistance um, obtained after. Um, after treatment, and, and they found that olorofilm uh, gave a very low level, um, uh, lower level of resistance than what you can obtain with voriconazole, which is uh, reassuring. Uh, but still, they were able to produce um, mutant in the lab after exposure, 
uh, with specific mutations uh, in the in the in the target, so the DHODH, DH, um, at the position one one nine, uh, where they will that they, they found that this position was producing resistance to allorafim, um, and so we have now. Uh, news that uh, the spread of um, drugs that are close to olorofim in the environment can also impact um, the, the resistance of the organism um, to olorofim um, uh, in, in humans. Then in terms of clinical impact, so there's a, a recent paper uh, published here in, in CID where they looked at the clinical impact of uh, the detection of uh, azole resistance. So um, uh, we were told uh, a few minutes ago that there, is, there was kit that uh, uh, enabled the detection of, uh, of uh, specific de um, uh, resistant mutations in Aspergillus fumigatus. And so they, they looked at um, the impact of uh, detection and then the modification the rapid modification of the treatment um, uh, um, after the detection of this uh, of these mutations, and so the the, the primary endpoint of uh, this uh, of this uh, of this uh, specific uh, study was uh, to look at the proportion of patients with uh, uh, azole resistant uh, invasive aspergillosis uh, in whom antifungal uh, treatment failure. Um, uh, was observed uh, uh, at the six week following the diagnosis. And they, they found um, interesting results, meaning that they did not find a very uh, strong uh, impact of uh, and, and very low uh, treatment failure in those um, cases. So only eight cases found with a resistant isolate and uh, mainly six that will be able to, to be investigated fully. Um, only one out of the six patients had a treatment failure and died at six weeks um, uh, when they changed the antifungal drug for uh, amphotericin B plus or minus uh, caspofungin. Uh, meaning that um, it's important to um, detect early the mutation, especially for aspergillus uh, fumigatus. But if you switch to um, uh, from voriconazole to uh, what is recommended in this case, meaning amphotericin B plus or minus echinocondins, um, the impact would not be so important on the mortality. So in conclusion, uh, um, the, the, the resistance tends to increase, but can be limited in specific areas. That's the, that's the case in France uh, and for specific bugs, for example. Um, of course, the, the more the, the pathogen is uh, known, the more it's easy to describe the resistance and, uh, and, and to, 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 to use tools that have already been described to, to do so. Um, uh, globally speaking, if you are dealing with Candida glabrata, you can really have um, uh, resistance to echinocondins uh, quite uh, early after uh, exposure to, to echinocondins. And uh, the minimum uh, we observed in France was five days um, uh, of echinocondin treatment to uh, generate the same uh, strain, but with a mutation. So uh, really pay attention to deep abdominal infections and uh, urinary tract uh, infections with, uh, with echinocondins. Uh, but uh, of course, the increase uh, of the prevalence can be obse observed in specific countries. I showed you some uh, specific maps where you saw the, 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 the variation between countries. Um, and in addition to uh, acquired resistance, we see also an emergence of fungi with intrinsic resistance in those patients who were pre-exposed to, to antifungal drugs. And we're still missing uh, sensitive tools um, for early diagnosis of, of resistance, that's, that's for sure, and we need to, to work on, on that. And, uh, and, and this is a challenge because we really face um, problems of, uh, of fungal load to be able to do so uh, and to have reliable results. So with this, I'm, I, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to, to discuss and to have questions with you with the other um, uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elanio. Um, it's, uh, it is, it's clear to see it, um, that there is, um, there's a need for improvement in that, in that area as well. And, um, uh, but we really appreciate your comprehensive look and, and to, what's available now and and um you know what we should all be looking for so um i know we're uh, a little over time here so um 
we did have a, a, a couple of questions. I know if, if people need to leave, I know Dr. Speck had to leave for a, another meeting, um, but um, there yeah. was a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, first for uh, Dr. Halur, um, beyond the diagnosis of pneumocystosis, what would you believe would be other mycoses that would benefit from the use of methods based on immunohistochemistry? Uh, yeah, thank you. I think uh, Diego asked that question and uh, a good question indeed, because uh, uh, IHC can be used for diagnosis of aspergillosis, invasive candida, as well as uh, invasive mucormycosis. Their positivity is quite low. For example, in mucormycosis, the culture positivity is again like candida, less than 50%. And the treatment is different for aspergillus as well and uh, for mucormycosis. So, uh, in case you have a patient where the pathologist is unable to make a diagnosis of uh, work, uh, of, of mucormycosis versus aspergillosis, the IHC would be very helpful and. Uh, help and guide the treatment of the patient as well. So this is what I can think of. Uh, uh, and and uh, other than that, uh, uh, I, we don't use it, but uh, from literature, I found that uh, there's a lot of cross uh, uh, reactivity in uh, immunohistochemistry. Thank you. Um, and another question um, from, or for Dr. Samadar. Uh, do you have any experiences to share related with the implementation of the histoplasma antigen test in India? Yeah, I mean, so one almost uh, one and one and a half years back, I uh, what I did was that means uh, in my setup actually, since this is a neuro institute and we get a lot of uh, cases of chronic meningitis, so uh, I started thinking about uh, the cases which actually are diagnosed negative for all the uh, known pathogens known to cause chronic meningitis. For example, tuberculosis, for example, some cases of cryptococcal meningitis, even other parasitic infections, so, and uh, very few bacterial infections. So after excluding all those, uh, I mean, uh, cases, infectious cases, and after excluding a non-infectious diagnosis also, we really don't have any clue, right? What is the cause of chronic meningitis? And most of these patients were, uh, I mean, just put on anti tubercular therapy just based on a clinical suspicion of clinically diagnosed meningitis. So we started collecting the samples and we tested this. So we got some positives for histoplasma galactamine. And then those were all the probable cases with the features of CNS, means radiological. Uh, findings similar to that of tuberculosis, CNS TB, and all other features matching like TB. So clinically, they were diagnosed, but microbiologically, there was no evidence of TB anywhere. So I think that uh, this is already there, and maybe it is accounting for some of the cases of this uh, meningitis. But still, I'm not sure, and I don't have any proven case. So I don't know means uh, how exactly to. Uh, analyze that, but uh, of course, yes, it has some sort of, uh, uh, you know, importance. And one most importantly, what I remember is that means these fungi are no more endemic fungi. They are not just confined to any particular geographical pockets or locations. They are more of a geographic fungi. They are distributed in many, many places, even without known endemicity. And many of these cases are not properly diagnosed because of lack of diagnostic tools, because of lack of knowledge. It's close resemblance with another endemic disease in India that is tuberculosis. So it might, it is definitely there. In, in others, when I was there in one of the states of India, that is Rajasthan, which is a very, very arid and uh, having a very low rainfall, where you don't expect histoplasma to be there. Generally, it has been described along the rivers with a moist and warm and humid climate. But uh, we never expect histoplasma to be thriving in completely arid regions in desert conditions. So we found cases there as well. So it is not strictly restricted to any particular location. So it may be there and maybe we are not diagnosing adequately for sure. OK, thank you. Um, Dr. Lanio, uh, what are what are some ways uh, in your in your opinion that uh, there can be greater awareness 
uh, of looking for resistance um, or drug monitoring. Um, you, you mentioned there needs to be an improvement of tests for for resistance um, identification, but what are ways to bring greater awareness for uh, clinicians to or yeah clinicians to look for this in patients? So I would I would recommend the clinician to discuss with the microbiologist because um, the microbiologists are really aware of and this is true uh, it's true in bacteriology it's true in in mycology we are aware of uh, of uh, the the resistance we are aware of of the the epidemiology the local epidemiology so I would recommend the the, the, the clinicians to to look at their epidemiology in in their wards and to know uh, what kind of um, of fungus they are facing so sometimes you in specific settings you can have very rare very rare rare organisms and those rare organisms could be resistant like intrinsically first and then uh, to analyze also their practices, meaning uh, how how long they treat the patients. Um, and so looking at the impact of treatment, early impact, even in the uh, in in the um, in the flora, meaning uh, uh, in the stools, in, in on the skin, um, can help people to realize that um, there is there is impact of antifungal drug prescription. On, on the on the bugs you have on on your in your body, and this can be uh, a problem when uh, the patient will come back later uh, with another problem and, and, and potentially with resistance. So, I would I would recommend to be curious and and uh, and and you will you will find what you 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 will search for. Very good, thank you. Um, well, I think we we're. We'll probably need to wrap up um, as we're a little bit over our time here. I, I really want to say thank you to uh, all of the presenters um, and uh, and you all are, are experts in in these fields and, and what you were presenting on. And we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and, and your understanding and passing that along uh, to everyone here. So um, a special thank you to uh, to Dr. Samadar for initiating this webinar and and uh, for helping coordinate um, a lot of the details uh, from his end and uh, and and the all the information that you all heard today. So thank you to Dr. Samadar for for helping initiate that. Um, also, we will be will be making this recording available, so you all will have uh, these. Um, I I think as soon as it's over, you you should receive a link to that, so you will have that available as well. Um, Again, thank you to, to everyone who joined today. Thank you to all the presenters. Um, we really appreciate this and, and hope you all have a, a wonderful weekend. So uh, for now, we're saying goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Alexander. Thank you, JT, and thank you, Vinay, for making time for this evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.